Mrs. Flick, ladies and gentlemen, what about Corona? Now, what could have been done, or what will happen after? Now, here we may see a threshold and, and a, a, a turning point. So, historical turning points, how do they emerge when looking at them from a future perspective? What are the medium and long term perspectives? Historians usually need more time or, say, time related distance. Or, giving you an example, the French Ancien Regime before 1789 was a term of an era. But this term was not coined in 1789. No, it was coined uh, by attentive, say, viewers in the 19th century. Alexis Tocqueville and Jacob Burckhardt were agreeing that their own presence in the 1840s, 50s, and 70s were still times of the revolution era, which started, you may say so, in 1789, but which still had an effect in 1799 or 1815. And you could never say, there's an end, there's a beginning. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Corona is a reason and also a catalyst, but also a cause for a qualitative change of geopolitical situations and constellations in our era. And many American think tanks and others too ask whether or not uh, Corona will introduce a kind of translatio epiarii, meaning the substitution of one global power by another. The erosions of similar things have always been, say, the normal case in history. This applies to the Roman Empire under, under Hadrian, maximum expansion. It also is true for the division of the Roman Empire in East and West. And Eastern Rome has been accompanying us until yesterday when Mr. Erdogan said, we have now um, Muslim rights in the Hagia Sophia, and uh, you know he made it clear what he's thinking. After 1453, after the capture of Constantinople, the Osman Empire emerged. But you see, world empires are not only a matter of European history, but of global history, history of the world. Look at India, look at China. Here we will find lots and lots of world empires which have existed long before the 19th century. We can also look at the Holy Roman Empire as a benevolent empire, i.e. an empire which was not in a position to wage wars but it was a kind of territorial buffer zone. And between 1648 and early 19th century, it helped to prevent certain wars. We can also refer to the fact how through one dynasty, the Habsburg dynasty, was influenced, uh, you know, they were able to combine 1588. It was a response to the disruption of the confessional unity. But this dimension, forming em empires, they, these aspects are not part of a European history, but also part of the world history. And looking at Charles V, the empire, now this was not only a pristine, a virgin, you know, queen on the European continent. No, here we, are, we were also talking about an empire. And, you know, this was a country, this was an empire where the sun never sets. And if you look at the small Portugal, what it did in the 16th century, it was forming a colonial empire, then you will understand the dimension I'm talking about. Surely we could continue this history. We could also look at the subdivision of the world in the 18th century. It's not about the colors, but have a look how the gray zones have changed between 1880 and 1898. And surely we can also look at September 1942, when the two most radical empires, uh, that is the empire 
because of the 20th century national socialism, Nazi Germany, and the aggressive, expansive Japan tried. And I think you can see it very clearly. And this was before the Battle of Stalingrad and, you know, the defeats in the Pacific. You know, here you can see how they tried to subdivide the world among themselves today, and this is what I would like to elaborate on, we today have other imperial consequences and crises. The question which arises is whether or not under coronavirus conditions we are also, you know, fighting for the prerogative of interpretation. You know, this has to do with fake news, this has to do with data, news, information. All this is part and parcel of the history of empires. This refers to the Pax Augustana, this refers to the Pax Britannica in the 19th century. It was also true for a Pax Americana or Otto Wilson after Woodrow Wilson after the Second World War or the uh, Pax uh, or Sovietica, and it also is true for the imperial China. It didn't, uh, uh, you know, look for peace, but it brought uh, or promises global security and wants to prove that it is an imperial power. Corona, ladies and gentlemen, makes us understand and perceive this more clearly. But the situation, the constellation, is not new. It is always, you know, accelerated, you might say, and you cannot say Corona is more like a catalyst of all this. And this, of course, has to be seen in the context of the various tests, the legitimization or legitimacy uh, crisis and others. You know, the 21st century, young people, you have AI algorithms, digitalizations. This is what has to be taken into account. Now, in this case, I would like uh, to touch on three trends of our own present day world. Number one, the conflict between the United States and China. Now, this is a conflict between empires using new instruments and tools. And here you see it on the screen. It's about fighting for territories, you know, penetrating into the territories, but not in the mode of the classical <clears throat> state against state battles, but using our new possibilities. This has to do a war of populations of religions and a surgical interference, i.e. terror and crime. And in addition to territory, we also have uh, currencies which have no territory, and they are being used fighting for capital, fighting for uh, power, the fight for opinions, fight for interpretations, information, resources. China. Here we might refer you to um, the East China Sea, the development of the new Silk Road, and truly we can say that all this, you know, this has to do with territories and with disrupting, destroying territories. All this, you know, finds its pinnacle in Hong Kong. Looking at all this, it means that the rise of China and seeing it like this is wrong. And you know, China follows this, and other peripheries or peripheral states interpre interpret this in a different way. China, but also we're looking at the um, global history of the world, that it is not the rise of China, but it is rather the return of China to the pre, uh, say, European era in China, that is 1840, before that time, coming going back to the imperial area, European Union. Now, this is a benevolent empire, you might say. It is an empire which is not waging an offensive war or attacking war. And you might say, this is very un uh, unnormal, succeeded in three phases to pacify Europe. One, 
solving the German question for Western Germany first after 1945 and two, the transition of the 70s, you know, Greece, Spain, Portugal, you know, after the despots or tyrants, you might say, Salazar and Franco and 1980s, the end of the Cold War. Now, this is a benevolent empire. It is under pressure from inside and outside, and the pacification concept has been threatened in the Ukraine, in the Near and Middle East. And there's a third trend, re-imperialization, you might say, at, uh, since the end of the Cold War, also against the backdrop of a new multipolarity. Now, this is something which you can hardly find in the world history. Russia, one example. We find it also in our memories, you might say, you know, memories of the old Soviet empire. And, of course, I mentioned it already when thinking of what's happening in Turkey. These are all memories of a glorious past, the Osman, um, say, legacy. And, of course, uh, what happened yesterday is just, uh, say, reminding people of glorious Osman past. Corona. Now is like a kind of beacon for this translatio imperii, i.e. showing very clearly how quantities might convert into new qualities. And now, against all this, you always find forecasts, and I know historians uh, are, it is not really up to historians to look into the future. You know, here we have a crisis, and this means they, the historians have to look at the situation under conditions of permanent uncertainties. A pandemic as a historical, say, breaking or turning point is something new, but the heuristic and hermeneutic Hermeneutic ice is very thin, so this is what we have to bear in mind. And of course, there are uh, lots of things which might help us to understand the situation better. The ladies and gentlemen, I would like to, you know, give you two ideas. There is no historical blueprint for handling mastering crises neither studying the First World War when it comes to looking at or handling current crises, nor looking at the Spanish flu of 1918 or 19 when it comes to, you know, handling the coronavirus pandemic. But the historical perspective always includes a kind of historical differentiation. The mode of understanding is not knowing better, but seeing more. This is what it is all about. So, what, is my, what are my observations? Number one, pandemic and war. Now, pandemics, and compare them with wars and fundamental historical crises, well, you know, this is uh, something which people like to do at the beginning of a crisis. Now, if you look at the response, uh, the first response to the corona crisis, there were always so war type uh, or bellicose metaphors they used. And of course, they always have to uh, look at uh, the particular decisions which will, take it, which will be taken afterwards. This is important. Now, when say that uh, people divided like this, then a virus will be considered to be an enemy, i.e. certain countries are responsible for, say, infection rates, etc., infection paths, etc., etc. So this is always the persons, people doing things like this, using it. Then here, looking at the Spanish flu again and crisis. You know, this is something which is often mentioned these days. You know, people try to remember the experience of the Spanish flu at the end of the First World War. But, but again, you had a Translatio Imperii happening at the time. The continental European empires, the Tsars, the Habsburg, the Osman empires, they were all 
dying out and the colonial powers, UK, France, and to some extent Italy, experienced their maximum expansion. And the 1970s, the Bolsheviki, and then the US Americans entering the war, th all this showed coming up over the horizon new empires, empires, new ways forward. But the differences between historical events and the presence are even more re revealing, you might say. The pandemic of 1918, first of all, it affected Asia, Africa, the United States, and Latin America. And after that, at the end of the World War, it reached Europe. Now, the high numbers of victims showed the level of exhaustion of people. You know, people living in Europe, they suffered from war, they suffered from lots of problems, you know. And in Spain, there was, there, there was a newspaper, there were newspapers really talking about these, uh, this pandemic, but nevertheless, the virus or this disease was given the term, the name Spanish flu. But the most important historical event was perceived or seen only after some time later, that the Spanish flu had more victims than all the military or civil victims at the time put together. You know, this is something which nobody knew at the time of 1918-1919, and therefore the, this, is, this is something which we sometimes find. You know, you can't sometimes see things if you are living in this present. You know, at various military fronts, we had uh, lots and lots of people living or there or suffering there. You know, then after the war, people thought, OK, we do not want to have battles like or war like this anymore. We want to build up in new societies. And in the post-war phases, which people were dreaming of, this, this, this hope, it appeared as a kind of mixture of hope, uh, optimism, and at the same time also as threatening. And you might say the Spanish flu was a cat catastrophe of many catastrophes happening in parallel at the time, and this before the armistice, before the Paris uh, uh, peace uh, conferences created a certain kind of globality, that is, the globality of infection chains and infection paths. The coronavirus pandemic, you know, emerged completely different. It started at the end of 2019, not against the background of a world war, which was fought in 1918, 1919, you know, hospitals, worldwide transportation of military, uh, military and, and troops to this and that. This is how it started then. But today, they did not have, say, shared expert knowledge. This is what we have today. No international health organization, no updated data which are available you know, at, uh, say, every every hour, and, and no coordinated search for a vaccine. But nevertheless, similar to 1918, the coronavirus pandemic also reveals certain mechanisms of the flows of the interconnectedness of the world today, and therefore the focus on worldwide mobility of information and capital, but also news, fake news, tourists and business people. In the first infection waves, you might say that the pandemic could be, could be seen as a disease of those having, you know, profited from globalization and, you know, when they were forced to restrain or their ability was restrained, then they thought, okay, their basic rights are being, say, infringed. But then when it became clear that the, uh, the virus, you know, affects everyone, then suddenly it became clear that mainly the weak or mostly the weak will be affected by this. You know, the coronavirus pandemic also kind of introduced, introduced new hierarchies. My third observation is globalization, deglobalization, and locality. You know, after the end of the first war, we had a characteristic interaction between glo globalization and localization or deglobalization. And I believe this will be characteristic for the time after Corollas. The 20s and the 30s of the 20th century were always a kind of example for, for, for creating international cooperation and interconnectedness on the one hand, and at the same time, batting down your hatches 
um, at the same time. You know, the United States, in terms of finances, in terms of policies, you know, achieved a global impact because of the one word, the young plan, the, the most plan, all, all, all the plans. They were all based on U.S. American financiers or financial experts, and they dealt with the German reparations. And, you know, after the failure of the ratification of the League of Nations uh, treaties and the Treaty of Versailles, and this, you might call it America first. You know, after 1920, this was also must be seen in the context of uh, the worst race uh, up. Uh, rose or uprisings in uh, in America, and of course here there were certain conspiracy theories also coming to the fore. So you might say structural globalization and sectoral anti or deglobalization after profound experiences of crises, you know, came together complemented all the findings, you know, uh, when it comes to expanding one down's power to, 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 to action, then this is important. And this ended up in a, say, paradoxical situation. On the one hand, we had universal and particular, you know, domains of actions. In 1917, and the Bolsheviki, they found a term called self-determination. And this term alone did not mean genuine universalism, but it meant uh, Slavs for and it meant for Slavs something completely different compared to Koreans, Japanese or Chinese. Now this global constellation, I believe, also is true for the period after the end of the Cold War. On the one hand, after 1989 or 1990, the supranational integration, particularly in Europe, also, you know, involved an erosion of the sovereignty of national states. You might say the conventional national state of the 19th century lost within the European Union its significance. For two reasons, sovereignty transfers as part of an increasing on an ongoing European integration and new nationalisms, which, were, which you can see, say, in Scotland or in Catalonia. And at the same time, national states still have an impact as an important and even crucial, you know, reference in, in, in times of crises when it comes to guaranteeing savings deposited to the bank like in 19 uh, sorry in, in in 2008 also in 2015 the refugee crisis or when it comes to making sure that the state helps people in terms uh, in times of a crisis i.e. the coronavirus pandemic the tension between different globalization paths and deglobalization re responses, this dichotomy, you might say, will be with us for quite some time. Then uh, territories and removal or breaking up territories. If you look at the, uh, at the, at the beginning of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, then this reminds me of um, Stefan Zweig. He said, Nature does not know catastrophes. Humans alone, mankind alone, know catastrophes whenever they experience. And this brings us to the analysis, the interpretation, plannings, the forecasts. You know, the infection had an impact and it uh, has been considered or seen as a profound uncertainty when it comes to handling a crisis and the situation itself has been questioned. And in this case, the appeal dominated to make sure that uh, the state guarantees a wonderful or good health system. So in this case, here we see the dichotomy between the global challenges but also the local responses. And a virus doesn't know any, any, any borders or limits, but this does not say anything about the response of people who always use their past experiences in order to handle current situation. You know, if you look at the facts, then, of course, the subjective perceptions which might guide you in solving a problem. The national states, being a, a health uh, 
promoting states or others you know, will also lead to conspiracy theories or to defining certain groups of people being responsible for all the evil there is. And since 2008 and 2015, we can say that we have a kind of nationalism, you know, focusing on, on say, uh, the results of the crisis in 2008 and 2015. Despite this, I can say that with the coronavirus pandemic, we have some um, return to territories again. Suddenly, borders were closed. Suddenly, uh, people were talking about a crisis-related emergency and terms protection, infection, risk. They were defined in territorial terms. And all this, you know, when looking at the pandemic and thinking about the openness of states, then this way of thinking was like an atavism. And of course, the reversal is rather unlikely, and it might lead to a different experience with a view to economies. And the state might, all, might not only be a part of a supply chain, but might become a kind of warehouse. And this brings me back to the beginning of my presentation. Coronavirus pandemic does not mean that we will not, not only mean that we will have a nationalism based on territories, but also territory based cultures. China, Silk Road, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Russia, Turkey, there's a mixture of politicized Islam and anti-Western promises. And now the last but one observation here, we see a fluid and moving, changing presence. Life under the corona pandemic might be considered to be um, an agglomeration of paradoxical aspects. And this shows you there are lots of successes, lots of, say, legacies which have been developed or emerged over the last decades. It refers to the, to the life. It refers to the knowledge or non-knowledge about pandemics and growth and knowledge about diseases, about infections, about treating them, etc., etc. And at the same time, not knowing about the, you know, new vaccines, new uh, aspects. Now, in the context of the state responses, i.e. lockdowns, emergency situ situations, closing borders, etc., etc., we must see that this is added, meaning here certain personal freedoms were constrained, and taking away these rights of freedom led to, say, demonstrations. Individual power of actions was restricted, yes. But at the same time, you now also see critical, say, awareness of citizens, an opinion, critically looking at what the state is doing. And this might also lead to a comparison with the Ancien Regime I mentioned before. And you know, citizens look at their government in times of a crisis as um, a certain, say, element. and. It, this element will now, say, reduce their freedoms. So globalization, deglobalization, these two aspects become facts of our lives today. The spread of the virus is the one on the one hand. The other hand, it's the it's the 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 the, the, the say the particular or the subdivision of powers down to the regional local levels. But you know, the juxtaposition of global and local answers to the pandemic, uh, coronavirus pandemic will lead to comparisons, to competition, an ongoing competition, competition between successful and non-successful uh, uh, virus fights. Then the competition among lender in, in Germany, states, uh, states, or provinces in other countries, or then countries of the world. And this means you start doing global comparisons. It's just in, in other terms. Against this background, background of the comparability, 
Against this background, I say we cannot simply come up with a causal nexus between experience of crisis and authoritative, uh, say, experiences, which people often mention at the beginning of the crisis. You know, sometimes they compare things with the times after the First War. Ladies and gentlemen, this crisis does not happen under situations which we selected. It is not a perfect fit for, say, um, a tyranny. The empires in the, 19th, in the 20th century also made sure that they could define their way forward. The, 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 the virus does not allow to do that. Authoritarian uh, regimes and other uh, demands, you know, if somebody does not comply with these or those rights, um, you know, here we see some effects. But we must also say that globalism on the basis of available and decisive data, resources, etc., etc., this um, are also elements of our approach. And we might also say that we learn anew the presence, that this crisis also helps uh, those helping and others. A polarization will emerge. But on the other hand, we might also see um, a stronger polarization, meaning emotional society and rational society to find this and, you know, uh, uh, other aspect. Now, where uh, having all said all this, where are we now? And I said it in the beginning, when looking at our pre-past, this is what we usually do, but uh, coronavirus hasn't got a uh, delimited ancien regime. But I believe the likelihood of a world, you know, at a turning point, a world um, at crossroads, trans in the process of transformation. This is something which we will see. It might take longer and it might, you know, develop further in these times of a crisis. Now, if we look at this, uh, at this uh, say, accelerated development, we see lots of new things, but also old things. We've got the imperial tensions, United States, China, Russia, etc., etc., Turkey. This is one aspect. But the other aspect is that today we can no longer be sure, like we were a year ago, whether beneath the surface of the supposedly known prefigured presence, something absolutely new might surface, which will go beyond the hermeneutics framework of our narratives. Journalists of a weekly, Hamburg Weekly, wrote a brief text. Uh, oh, sorry, I was asked to write. Uh, the, the, a, a journalist asked Peter Strauss uh, in, in Germany to, to write a good piece. And he said, hardly any of the major world changes is reflected in the drafts of the new century. This is what they said. No anti-baby pill, no German reunification, no digital revolution, nothing. The most important aspects and events always happened unexpected. And sometimes people do not see which, be, which has been in the making for a long time. And I can say that what we use or the approach we use might be questionable. Just try to write history looking at inconsequences, looking at disruptions. You might determine and define events in the history which happened without preparation. And the last sentence was, those thinking in terms of emergencies who are not drinking anymore will not be able to experience the future. Thank you.